Hello and welcome to Simply Intoxicating. The flavor and also the fragrance of the 20th GST Council meeting was very similar to what we saw in the initial days of the GST Council, the first three, four meetings before the introduction of the GST. Good number of people might see and view it as a kind of election kind of scenario. The number of decisions the GST Council took in order to give more confidence to the customers, to the industry, to the trade, in terms of simplification of law, in terms of simplification of procedure, in terms of removing and sifting good number of items, which was quite unexpected for good number of people, from 28% slab to 18%, good number of items, perhaps will go in the direction of women empowerment also. So good number of decisions yesterday. For, for the first time, the standing finance minister, Mr. Peace Goel, chaired the meeting and it was pretty successful for him. So full credit to him and all the state ministers, of course, who supported him for, uh, for, for taking all these crucial decisions, a large, a very large matrix of decisions. So we have three domain experts with us who are going to look into it, the implication, how the industry is going to look at all those changes to what extent it's going to be welcome, how exactly the policy makers are going to implement them. So all the challenges we have, Mr. M. Sinha, Joint Secretary TRU Ministry of Finance, one of the critical hands who has been sort of you know assisting in making of all those changes, the simplification, particularly the return side, a lot of contribution, we will touch that, the new return format. We have Pratik Jain, the national leader, uh, indirect taxation, PWC, our knowledge partner also. And we have, of course, Mr. Sudhir Raman, Senior Vice President in the Coca Cola. Let me start with Pratik. A lot of decisions. You know, I mean, did you expect so many decisions? I mean, suddenly, you know, the tax rate simplification, of course, we knew that. But particularly the tariff side, you know, there are a lot of changes. No, in fact, it came as a, as a rather pleasant surprise because what we were expecting was the legislative bulk of the discussion would happen the legislative proposed changes, which are 40, 46 odd changes. Some discussion on the simplification of the return process. And maybe very minor tweaking in the rate of tax on some handy uh, uh, goods, etc., etc., handicraft and things like that. And that was what the expectation was. But what came out was, of course, uh, much more than what we expect. I think three, four things are coming out very clearly to, to me from directionally. One is this 28% category is becoming uh, redundant, right? And I'm, I think that's a very good move from a policy standpoint because. Initially, the 28% was supposed to be restricted only on things like luxury goods. cars and irritated grains, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, tobacco, and then gradually it uh, uh, got expanded. Uh, in no other country in the world, you have this kind of a peak rate of 28% plus says, of courses on few commodities. If indirect tax, the way it works is that if you have moderate tax rate, your consumption increases, and we have seen that over and over again uh, over the last several uh, several years. So I think that's that's very good. Second is compliances still remain a concern for the industry as well as the government. And I think that has driven that 5 crore up to 5 crore the quarterly return. I think it is a very bold move, very good move over 90% of the uh, businesses will be uh, will be able to uh, sort of uh, you know use this. Of course, there is some confusion which is whether it's so only for B2C and B2B plus B2C or you know, right. uh, so that, that needs to be clarified. Second is that as a purchaser, how will I claim credit? If the return is quarterly, I'll have to ensure that the vendors are uploading it on a continuous basis, which uh, you know may, may not be easy. But that decision is 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 uh, is, uh, is very good. And and the third is that government is very keen, and that got referred uh, many times yesterday that the benefit of this has to be passed on to the customers. And I think the anti-profiteering authority will will go for overdrive now again uh, after 27th when when they see the uh, the and, and which which justified. Whether it is uh, there. And, and the last point I think of the discussion did not happen is what happens to the revenue. Now, you know, there is an impact of 10,000 crore, which is fine, but where will the money come from? To, if you look at the target for this year, almost on an average, you have 1 lakh 10,000 crore that you have to collect, and you have only touched 1 lakh only once, right? So, where will the money come from? You are banking on A, increased consumption, and B, I think, which is, uh, you know, happened through a, you know, this got prominence after this MP High Court decision on EVA bill, etc. The administrative tightening, you will see, you know, uh, you know, even minor mistakes, you know, the authorities taking a uh, taking a view. And somebody mentioned in one of the programs that we did earlier that the data is the new danda now. So there's so much of data available with the government that that can be used. I think these are the three, four uh, things which are coming out, uh, but overall directionally very positive from a tax policy standpoint. And, and this on tax policy is minor point. 
uh, which is on hotels, right. where declared tariff is not the basis for taxing. I mean, a great move because you should not have GST on MRP, on capacity, on some uh, arbitrary value. You should always have right. GST on invoice value. Yeah. So those are the things that, that are giving us confidence. Yeah, Mr. Sizer, what about you? I mean, how I do think, you look at uh, very great credit to the government, I must say so, both the central and the state government and the GST council. Whatever we were always saying, no, we should not look at micros, we should look at macros in so many programs that you had conducted. I think to that extent, an explicit direction. As Pratik correctly said, we didn't expect so many number of items, 28 to 18, that was, uh, that was this. Uh, the larger issue that I felt was really very, very positive for me, which I felt was really the the, the crux of the amendment is that um, if you say that they have balanced it on all sides, they have balanced it on credit side, they have balanced it on the tax side in terms of the tax that has to be collected, they have also looked at the larger issue of how to drive the systems. I think that, con that concept that if you take away 90% of the people who are filing returns with the load date, I would, I would like to use a new concept called load date of 20th because 3 B is on 20th. Right. So the load date is 20th. If you take away 90% out of the load date on 20th, right. then you are giving capacity to the GSTN to handle this. So if compliance is the biggest selling point of, of, of broad basing the whole thing and, and, and they can focus on other things and look at how to absorb the capacity later on also, I must say so, because that will give them time to understand how to handle the quarterly returns for the others, for right. the people who fall below 5 crores. And the last but not the least, I think, which is very, very relevant is that the openness that was shown from the law review committee's reports that have gone to the GST council, their, kept their, their openness to accept suggestions and uh, even from an industry point of view to look at whatever credits. For example, there's one, if there are more than 20 people traveling by bus from a factory to the residence, credit that right. has come through this uh, last council's meetings. Yeah, that all provides for the fact that the government is looking at what the industry wants and what the trade wants. I think these are examples. There's no point in going through because you have to do two days of Correct. program Absolutely. if you have to go through what they have done. But I think if if there is any balance, I think they are going to, uh, to be achieved. We always looked at saying, no, we must have balance even on the macro side. I think they are going towards balance. What more you can expect the government to do for you? Certainly. So, I mean, let me go back to Mr. Sinha now. That this 5 crore thing, you know, the turnover, for which you have made it quarterly, however, the tax is to be paid monthly. To what extent this is going to ease the burden and to what extent do you think that the taxpayers and industry were actually looking for this kind of system, you know, although in any case it's an optional, I guess. This is what the release says. So to what extent this will help? See, uh, the direction in which compliance is moving across the world is that you make it so simple that small companies are able to do compliance on their own and they do not have to depend on compliance experts because that dramatically brings down the compliance cost. cost and the other collateral achievement of this kind of design which always happens is that you achieve better compliance. There is now enough empirical evidence to indicate that companies doing compliance on their own and when they are small they tend to report they tend to report their outputs better. So that was the philosophy with which the compliance was designed. As far as 5 crore is concerned, 5 crore actually, uh, if you come to think of it, it is not a very large turnover, but it does cover very large base. And once you're getting payment monthly, then there should not be any problem and we have experience of this. In service tax, after all, we were collecting monthly payment with 6 monthly return and Correct. service tax did run quite all right. So to that extent, compliance becomes easy. And uh, with monthly payment, if you are having basic data of output as well as the credits, then settlement also will happen 90% almost. So even the states have no uh, difficulty in uh, expecting that below 5 crore, whatever revenue is there, what part of that gets settled. So that also to the extent of 90% will get settled in first month, second month. And balance, little bit of balance of first and second month can get settled in the last month of the quarter. So overall, a huge relief.
for trade, he huge relief for tax administration because very large number of returns, data which is undigestible and so voluminous is also not a great idea. Right. And there is now empirical evidence and which Richard Bird often writes about is tax administrations tend to collect lot more data than they can use. So collection of data has to be commensurate with your ability to use the data. So it balances these factors and thereafter the council took the decision. So it's a, it's a great decision, it's a, great a decision, bold decision yes. and uh, trade will definitely not only benefit in terms of compliance cost, compliance time, etc. I think it will give them confidence to report better. Okay, that's wonderful. But now, I mean, one of the key decisions which the council took yesterday was, of course, approving the format for the new GSTR return. So, how exactly this, you know, as per the government press release, say that upload, lock, and pay. How this is going to work? See, the uh, any GST return, VAT return, will basically have two key components as to what are your uh, liabilities, which get reported initially, and then what are your credits. Then offset your offset your liability using your credit and pay the balance along with late fee. So that will be the structural design of the new return also. If you want to visualize in present context, you can think of uh, 3B and GSTR1 kind of coming together with uh, the invoice and exer populating the main return mm -hmm. and thereafter credit adjustments which you have to make. That's you, Credit assessment is your job. So the taxpayer does the credit assessment, decides how much of credit finally goes in his ledger, taking using that credit then he pays. So that is what is meant by upload. Upload is basically when you upload, your buyers get to see the invoice. So whatever invoice is uploaded by 10th of the succeeding month will become visible to your buyers. The visibility will be from day one, that means if your seller has uploaded it in on the 10th of April, then from 11th you will start seeing the invoice. That helps you gain confidence that this is a reported invoice. There will be facility to lock it also. So locked invoice is an admitted liability now from the seller side and the buyer has confidence that I can take credit. Okay. And then it, uh, the buyer gets that information in his credit table and the seller gets that information in his liability table and both have to build their return from there. So it is kind of handshake which takes place between buyer and seller. So that's the conceptual change which takes place vis a vis earlier design of auto reversal. That's how the new design will work. So I mean, Mr. Sridhar, you have a question? I mean, yeah, this will uh, result in pendency. I, I, I have got two questions, of course. This is more of a doubt, sir. Let us say we have completed July to June now. It's about a year is over. Now our September dates are coming towards the annual return. Now the first doubt that I have is this pay upload lock, that is the future. Now with regard to the September 25th compliance on the annual returns, now that will be based on the one that they have visualized right now or there would be an amended annual return for us because that's very key, that's point number one. Point number two, there's a, there's a small doubt that I have is that now we have completed 12 months. Various commissionerates have been asking people, letters are being sent regularly and people are replying, the reconciliations they are replying. They have downloaded their 2A and they are doing recourse. Now, will the, after this whole system is set right, will they set it right and try to do July to June or let us say July to June, I am just using that 12 months as a period. On this pay, but of course pay has no relevance. Can they lock it right now or will they look at going tracking it back and doing something so that the audit of this July to June is easy or how that will be kept? The credit audit of July to June, July 17 to June 18 because the new system will come henceforth only. So these two doubts that I have, that is very relevant because I feel that is, and then this, this looks very nice and I think one point I forgot to mention and Pratik also didn't touch upon I felt was in my opinion, that showed a huge sense of maturity. Amendment of returns, in my opinion, I think is the best thing that you can do. In a sales tax re re regime, you had revision of returns. Yeah. So they have bought this back in GST. So I don't know what more the trade can ask for after yes. we have to find things to ask for. I feel so much, they have done so much now. Yes. It should not lead to some indigestion problem. So right. I think that's that's a very first question that you asked, very, very important, sir. Maybe you can give some guidance that for the past period, when GSTR 2 has not mm. uh, has been deferred, 
how will we do the invoice matching? Is there any thinking on that? Because right now, the notices are only saying, 2A, there is a mismatch between 2A and new 3B, and you please justify. I mean, of course, that local notices people are receiving. So is that what is going to happen, or you will come up with, come up with some mechanism for the, for the past period specifically? Or they will try to lock project. in this entire 12 months by giving us some temporary facility, park this in a separate system and say that you try to confirm this mm. so that you are not put to test at the time of right. audit right. assessment. So, how this will happen? But this locking thing is likely to be prospective, I guess. No, no. See, the design which I explained will be prospective and it will not even be from 1st of July of this year. IT systems will take a while right. to get uh, developed and only after IT has been developed and tested that this will come into force. Now, coming for the past period, basically the question emerges from the uncertainty about what happens with, with GSTR 2 and 3. Because those yes, have been put on, those have been put on hold, but beyond hold, what is the question? Okay. I will say that this is a question which is being examined, and very shortly we should expect that on this question also we will attain finality. I do not personally expect, and it is only my estimate because in GST decisions are taken in after much discussion with states and large number of central officials also join in GST and is also taken on board. My guess is that you. I would not expect GSTR 2 and 3 to come back wholesale month-wise because that will be too much of compliance for the past with non-commensurate results expected. Yes. Uh, more of reconciliation of the past above a threshold is what I am looking at as the future possible direction till the date new, ta new return takes over. So perhaps it will happen for 9 months in one slot and thereafter for this year till the new return comes in second slot. So those two will be handled more by reconciliation. That's what my estimate is. I think that's that's very important point, sir, because I think today the authorities of different states are not clear. And therefore, you have cases where they're, they're getting letters, people Correct. are coming to verify, okay, please let us know how, you know. You create queues. So it's just creating some bit of a problem right now. Okay. One more dividend to also that we are not sure, right? At least the trade is not sure. We have got a couple of people who have asked us these questions. But then, we have received from X authority. So when we were asking, what do you mean by X authority? Then they are able to explain. It is a CGST authority that has asked us this question. Now, can I expect a similar response from SGST authority? I said, if I were you, I would write to the CGST authority, take a copy of this letter and the reply that you have posted before the CGST authority, mark it to your juris jurisdictional SG authority and close that situation so that he doesn't ask you the second doubt once again. Right. So this is my query, this was my reply. Please don't ask this query once again from your side. No, okay. I, I don't think that's, a, that's really the kind of reply we would like to give because one of the agreements during the GST process was that one SSE has one authority. And this principle gets breached only at a few places such as when you are verifying transitional credit of the past period because there there is a legal compulsion because of which you cannot empower the officer, cross empower the officers because separate lists existed in the constitution. But going forward post rollout of GST date, you have one authority. In most of the cases, you have been told as to who your authority and it is that authority only who will ask for reconciliation. The other authority can ask but it ha if it has a specific intelligence or something because intelligence based action is both authorities are uh, both authorities have the jurisdiction but i don't think this reconciliation really falls in that category it is more in the category of your jurisdictional officer asking you this okay. right so now the ev will front you know the, the the finance minister talked about that the government will come out with some sort of sop particularly after this madhya pradesh episode so, how exactly this new system is going to work? Because even the threshold issue, you know, the, although the, the, there are certain states which have got a new threshold, different from other states, so there is no uniformity. I mean, that has been the complaint in the industry for a long time. So, so far as penalty is concerned, of course, there was an announcement. But was it discussed in the council, the threshold by West Bengal government, it's different. Some of states notifying certain products only. The EB bill is required only for specified goods. So, you know, that kind of scenario. See, so long as those variable kind of item list and threshold remain intrastate, there should not be any problem because when something is moving interstate, then the national list applies if at all there is any. Second question is as to uh, what will happen to Madhya Pradesh situation and there are incidents all over the country where uh, transporters feel that they do not have clarity as to 
what is the extent of error in e-way bill which will lead to confiscation. So, uh, as the finance minister honorable has announced, uh, very shortly the officials of state and center will sit together and give you a clear SOP which will give kind of error, action to be taken, legal backing for that action. So once you have that kind of SOP which is uniformly applied across the country, this problem is... Although I'll just like to make one point I, and I think this is for, for the industry. I think in general, industry, the seriousness which is associated with e bill is not there in industry. When I go and talk to companies, still they are fighting about who should own it up, whether supply chain uh, should do it, whether finance or tax should do it. It's just that they, they, many of them just look at it as a procedural requirement. Mm -hmm. And to say that, okay, so long as I have evidence to, to pay tax and I invoice mentioned that, etc., you know, I, I should be fine. I don't think that's a, that's a right attitude because at the end of the day, it's a, there is a rule which has to be followed. Yeah. Now, of course, in some cases, there's a minor uh, error that you have, that's fine. But if you, you know, if you don't generate e-way bill, for example, in this case, part B was not generated apparently, then very difficult to come and argue that, look, it was a procedural lapse. So I think somewhere we'll, we'll have to find a balance. I think the SOP will really help, but I, I would really urge the industry also to look at it much, much more seriously than, than they are actually looking at it right now. And I think also there can be, I agree with the Pratik, I think you can't take the e-way bill. Very casually, when, yes. you, when, when the government is intending compliance, the industry and the trade have to cooperate. I think there is no two... There are two yeah, questions yeah. about these yeah, things yeah. and all. So yeah. that was not the intention at all. But there should be some logical approach by the concerned trade and the concerned industry. Let us see if you know you have a set of contractors. You need <coughs> to divide amongst them. Some of them are really good in their compliance. Some of them may not be. Generally, certain comp certain industries have taken a view. I will do everything for your part B also. Right. Please don't touch my touch. Their view is. Because your part B is not your part B, because it is my goods which is traveling. Correct. Absolutely. So, if as long as that kind of an approach is saying, then what Pratik is saying is, is happening. That means, I am taking care of part A and part B. Where is the problem? So, therefore, you are, you are, the only thing is, if there is an interstate transfer of a lorry between, mm. if it's traveled from Maharashtra to Goa, it it's very easy. Probably, yeah. But if it's traveled from Maharashtra to Uttar Pradesh, in between he has changed the lorry. So, at times then how that information is going, all those things are important. But I, I have one uh, other question which I wanted to put and, and that's something with industry feels. And most of the legislative amendments that have come or that is proposed are in the nature of clarifications where there was an, either an ambiguity or law perhaps was not drafted properly. And in other words, the intention in almost all cases was that this law should have read like this from July 1, 2017 onwards. Exactly. But as we see, only one change is prospective uh, or retrospective, the rest is uh, prospective or likely to be prospective. And that leaves the industry hanging somewhere in between. For example, high sea sale, if you say Schedule 3 will be amended, high sea sale would be there. No supply. Now, before that, of course, there is a circular to say that it is, it is not liable to tax, but industry will have to reverse credit, which again was never the intention. Now, so there have been court rulings which say that if there is a beneficial amendment, there is no problem in giving it a retrospective, retrospective. Uh, effect and some of that perhaps can be thought of otherwise again with this this 40 amendments you are looking at litigation for the past period well uh, this is a question which has to be divided in two parts part one is that do you want tax administrations to do lot of retrospective amendment because there is a history of it to Correct. in toward in the direct taxes side so one has to be very careful with retrospective amendments. My sense is retrospective amendment to the extent possible should be avoided. Some curative retrospective amendments are fine. Now coming to the present set of amendments which industry perceives as clarificatory, perhaps a SOP on enforcement and audit side will be in order so that they get a comfort as to revenue administration will not come back to say that from 1st of July 17 till the date of amendment this period was not covered or so right. I cannot say that for all it applies but it can apply to very large number of situations and that that also perhaps needs an SOP would be I will be carrying that message from here and see let us see as to how it uh, progresses as and when one it more thing also case. which I thought I'll ask sir is that let us say there have been so many suggestions that have come from the law review committee and much of it has got accepted by whatever the press release has come yesterday night so now 
some will go to, the entire thing that is accepted will go to the cabinet so now our only question is if the law review committee had have had an ex laundry list and in this installment the the government and the council in his wisdom felt so much could be taken so is there an intention that the same list would be left as outstanding and in the future committee meetings it would be council meetings it will be reconsidered for implementation oh the council will have to take a <laughs> call on this there are so many items pending ah. but of course i mean i mean he is the right person to tell us more about it that whether See, i will i will say that uh, in taxation perhaps you will not want to do very large number of changes in one go because industry also has to settle down with the changes okay. but if there was a good suggestion which you don't find uh, in the present list it will not be correct to either assume that even in future it, it will not be taken yeah. up as to what is urgent and what should be done now is no yardstick to judge as to what we will do or what the honorable council will decide for the future that's a question in the future and as we have seen council as a body has been highly responsive to the requirements of the trade to the requirements of the economy so uh, we hope to continue with this positive journey so you had a clarification on this uh, on the on the issue of binding of the itc the scope of the itc in this amendment particularly relating to canteen ah uh, see that i think with the with 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 the with the interpretation that is that is given from the last night's press information bureau is not if you read it there is a view that with regard to canteen services which are 5% now read with the notification after the last night service notification amendments would that be because we have very clearly said that if it is to be established by force of law and it is to be maintained as per force of law then credit would be available now but enhance the the 5% itself comes with the theory that the person who is providing that service cannot take credit our only issue is that when it comes out from him at 5% there should not be any restriction of credit at our level so it's like saying there is a beneficial amendment and uh, there is this 5% this should not act as a as a embargo on this because it i am just trying to give only one example i i'll tell you this under the old central excise regime for certain products you had capacity to pay the duty under the normal limit and and under the and under these uh, beneficial amendment which is 1% 2% as the case may be for example we had so many things we had juices 100% juices were on that category also now when you indicate something on the invoice let us say this concerned person who is providing that service indicates something on the invoice that should fall within the concept of a gst invoice for the recipient to take credit i am talking about this 5% category okay so, which is what i read if you read the intention of the amendments from the way the press release has come it doesn't look but then that's a genuine so, doubt. so we have uh, we have somebody to clarify that point <laughs> at this point i would i would say that wait for the notification and the law to get amended and do a fair reading of law i will say that taxation is moving more and more in the direction of positive school wherein the law is what it is so read it in the plain language the way it is and if the plain language doesn't convey any doubt please do not harbor ghosts because industry has this tendency of starting to doubt as to if some officer has this interpretation officers are also going to have interpretation which the language of the law conveys so if the language of the law doesn't link these two credits which you are saying one is the credit by the uh, catering service provider and the credit which he can take and the person who's availing of this catering service if the law doesn't read that way if the notification doesn't read that then way then there is no need so read when it comes read it as simply as you can yeah but that reminds me the embargo business the finance minister says that i mean that for itc you know the credit which was allowed to the textile sector it's a huge relief for them you know so but then again you have embargoed it up to 27th of uh, july So was it a huge amount? No, no, no. Just I mean, the clarification was that till twenty seventh of July, huh. whatever credit you have accumulated, that you will not get. Yes, you will not get. You will get prospective because you have to have one cut off date, right? Correct. So, so I think that's that's fair. I mean, although, although I think, sir, the only sector which is now left from the where inverted duty structure is not permitted is railways. I mean, uh. in all other sectors, uh, you have given the refund of inverted duty structure. Railways, one sector with output is at five, input is all at eighteen and twenty eight, and. If from a policy standpoint we are going in that direction that okay inverted duty structure should be allowed as a refund, then I mean 
our only request is that it should not be there for any sector or that. No, let me let me respond by saying that when it when the rates were being fixed at that point in time, fairly large number of industries and services came back to say that the old service regime is what we are used to, where full flow of credit was not taking place and the headline rate was lower. That suits us. Having got that, industry is slowly realizing that maybe credit flow is a better idea. So I think it, here you also have a situation of industry slowly adjusting to the new reality that a better design of GST for them and for tax administration is that don't adjust the headline rate by yes. blocking the credits. That's not really a very good design. Okay. So it's a, it's a question of past getting into GST also and over a period of time getting cleaned. That's how Absolutely. I see it. One, one more point I wanted to ask, sir. This is with regard to this uh, beneficial amendment of this 10% services uh, you can provide by a composition uh, dealer. Right. Now, uh, uh, and the point is that uh, the concept of 10% on turnover, this I think was also a part of the, of the com uh, to the committee, there was this suggestion that this concept of total turnover included exempted sales also, exempted product uh, turnover also. So now would that still remain because uh, then that that 10 percent is very vital because right. it was 5 lakhs to 10 percent. Mm. I mean there has been a quite a jump that was the first one. The second one was also which is very very relevant is now when we talk about the uh, ITC, mm -hmm. when we talk about the ITC we have said that if there is non-compliance by the supplier, I'll have to reverse no interest. Now, how I'm asking this question in relation to what Pratik pointed out, what will be the cutoff date for that amendment also? Okay. Because many things have happened between July to June because people have not understood their compliance. Many people, I, I wouldn't say there's no need to classify who is understood, who is not understood, but many people have not understood. No. And so many credits have been in question. So this is very vital. This is a very classic example of beneficial amendment. You will have to reverse, but no interest. That is the beneficial. So amendment. I think we will have to wait for the wordings how... You know, it is being used it's a question very closely linked to what will happen to GSTR 2 and 3 because this process was rooted through GSTR 2 and 3 in the initial design reversal and all. So once that issue gets examined and the decision is taken, perhaps the decision on this will also get taken. And as far as that uh, turnover uh, definition is concerned for the purpose of yes. finding the 20 lakh limit or the 10 lakh limit which is now, which is now gone to 20 lakhs, that total turnover would include exempted products uh, or not? No, no. That, that, again, that that's, a, that's something which, which I will also attain clarity because I do not remember the drafts per se and it is for some other wing to do it. But the language will clearly convey. See, there are two limits. One will be 10% of turnover and the other limit is whatever amount is specified. Okay. So that amount is the floor level of benefit. And if your 10% is above that, you will get higher of the two. If I recall right, I mean, at least my impression is that it's only the taxable turnover, not the, not the total turnover, but the postpaid. Yeah, we will have to see that, the wording in that there. So, that another very important which everybody was talking about and people are actually, you know, demanding it in the trade industry, this National Advance Ruling Authority. What happened to that? I mean, did the council discuss it today? In the legal amendments, I do not remember having seen it, but this is an issue which is uh, strongly, uh, this is under discussion and I, I think this issue will have to be resolved. We are aware of it, law committee is very well seized of it that conflicting advance rulings are coming and you have to give a mechanism by which it gets resolved. So we should see resolution of this issue shortly. So exactly will what will be the amendment. mechanism and how I, I would not like to guess that but it's an issue which will get resolved. Okay, so I mean, I mean then this uh, fourth August meeting focused on MSME, I mean, is it going to be, you know... In, in fact, sir, I was, so I yeah. was listening to Mr. Amit Mitra, he was saying yesterday that in the fourth meeting, chances are that other than, you know, 28% remaining item also, there will be a debate. And our intention is, at least he said his intention is that 28% should be only be limited to those few products. 
So, but the announcement of the council was that it was more focused on the MSMEs, etc. on the next meeting. So, uh, not very sure, sir. Is it again going to be reviewed, the rate of tax? Uh, right very now? difficult to guess. guess because, okay. because you see, these agendas are done by the council secretariat. Okay. I would not know. when Once it gets frozen only, one would get to know. And I think we are too green from the last meeting two days back only it has happened. <coughs> too early to guess for anyone. Okay. So before we'll wrap it up, my question is to Pratik on this. Uh, did you expect this uh, exemption for this uh, you know, sanitary pad? I mean, that was one issue which was uh, grabbing the headlines in all the media. I was uh, kind of expecting that because it's something which was already doing the rounds and I think there was a momentum which was being built uh, through various, uh, uh, you know, a lot of member of parliaments and a lot of, uh, you know, prominent uh, you know, female personalities have written about it. Uh, I think somewhere we missed the picture, right? Uh, uh, you know, in GST, it's never a right strategy to exempt a product. I mean, unless it's uh, really something which is uh, very, very important. Uh, ideally, if you would have reduced the tax rate, let's say from 12 to 5, that would have been a preferable model to do, to deal with that. Because once you exempt it, that also means that the uh, that import effectively becomes that much cheaper. To the extent you have an input credit loss as a man manufacturer, that input credit loss is not there for the exporter who's exporting it to India. Yeah. And therefore, assuming that is 3% here, your imports will become 3% cheaper. Now, obviously, you have other ways of dealing with it. You can increase the basic custom duty and look at anti-dumping. All of those things are there. But conceptually, exempting a product is never a, never a good idea. Uh, I was not expecting an exemption. But uh, you can't question that as well. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, GST Council also, you have to realize that it comprises of politicians and there are considerations which uh, at times uh, uh, are there as well, which is beyond economics. So, can't contest that decision. I was not expecting it, but industry should be happy with that. But now again, anti-profiting authorities will be, will be watchful. But Mr. Sadar, you tell me, I just want to understand from consumer's perspective, that exemption in case of sanitary pad now. So you, Naturally, the manufacturers will have accumulated credit. Yeah, but because they are not getting the credit. But then there is no one to one correspondence. A particular manufacturer, who's, let us say a consumer goods, if he is doing, whatever that company could be, apart from sanitary pads, manufacturing and selling, he could be so many other things. Other products. But to now, that extent, but that to what extent the attribution will happen, all that would now become a, uh, Correct. A, a, an issue. That is one. And, and more than second thing is on this or like the same conversation something was really very pointable was if television sizes of a particular nature only should be uh, enjoyable for the lower rate of duty that is 28 to 18 then also then we must have thought we thought about uh, footwear lower than thousand greater than thousand right. but when it came to scents and perfumes we never thought of 500 rupees bottle and a greater than 500 rupees bottle of 100 ml to that extent uh, i felt because when we had gone so much deep into footwear right so we want to promote that industry yeah. it's, it's, a, so it's a very nascent at industry. this stage it has not come but you know i, I think to great give credit to the government i think government has realized that this value-based thing, et cetera, et cetera, capacity-based, MRP-based levy is not the right policy. I mean, I'm talking only talk, talking about right tax policy, and therefore you have seen, uh, you know, like hotels I, I mentioned, it's going away. I think all of these things will go away over a period future, of time. Yeah, yeah. It's just just a question of when and not, uh, you know, why or uh, things like that. I think sometimes, you know, the, the politics of the situation drives the decision, sometimes the economics. We as you know, a tax professional would hope that it's more of economics, less of politics, but that's, that's an ideal world, right? So I think from a policy standpoint, and directionally, it's very clear that the government also believes somewhere that it's not the right policy. Right. So on this note, let me thank all my three uh, distinguished guests. And all of them have made it very clear, the key takeaways are that we are actually design-wise, the GST is moving in the right direction. Quite a few positive steps have been taken in terms of tweaking the design or redesigning or re-engineering the design. So looking at one of the decisions so far as tariff rationalization is concerned, moving good number of items in a very short span of time, although it will have a serious revenue implication. Mr. Goel did not talk about to what extent the exchequer is going to take the hit. That will become a concern or probably it will slow down the liberalization and rationalization efforts in future. So that is something perhaps, you know, uh, that needs to be debated later. As a taxpayer, perhaps taxpayer will not be concerned immediately. Industry will perhaps be very happy presently. So that is, a, that is going to cause a few wrinkles on the forehead of some of the policy makers and the revenue collectors. They will think about it later. 
But apart from that, if you look at from the simplification perspective, rationalization perspective, legislative changes, good number of that, widening the scope of the ITC, so several positive steps and very good signal the government has given and in a very short span of time, let's give credit to our policy makers, the lawmakers, the GST council and also the taxpayers and industry which have been cooperating, although expectations will always remain very high than what is going to be delivered. But that you know, the GST has more or less the Indian variety of GST, which is very unique in terms of various features. It, 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 it is going to settle down. It has already settled down in a big way. And with the following decisions taken by the GST Council at its 28th meeting, you can expect good tangible hike in the compliance index in the coming months and hopefully in the revenue collections also. Thanking you all for watching TLT.